Hello, I'm Ralph Gable of the Electronics for the Inquisitive Experimenter YouTube channel. Soldering, the foundation of electronic projects that actually work. As a teenager, one of the things that was way too often the downfall of any of my projects was poor solder joints. This all changed when I went in the Air Force and they taught us how to solder the right way. In this video, I will be covering the foundational knowledge associated with the soldering process. If you have questions or comments, please feel free to add a comment to this video. I make a concerted effort to respond to every comment. If you find this video helpful, please click on the like and don't forget to subscribe. The first question that we need to answer is, well, what exactly is solder? What exactly is solder? Solder is an alloy of two or more metals, which is melted onto an electrical connection. If everything is at the proper temperature and the surface of the metals is clean, the solder will cling to the connections, making a reliable electrical connection. The melting temperature of the solder depends on the particular mixture of metals in the alloy. It turns out, that with a mixture of 63% tin and 37% lead, the minimum melting temperature of 361 degrees Fahrenheit or 183 degrees Celsius is achieved. And this is the most popular of the solder alloys for leaded solder. With the emergence of the EU's concern over lead and other toxic chemicals in their landfills, Solder which contains lead, such as what I was just talking about before, is now no longer legal to use in products in many countries across the globe. As a result, they had to come up with a lead-free way to solder electronics together. This lead-free solder still has tin as the primary metal. A lot of the lead-free solder simply adds a little copper like 0.7%. So it's 99.3% tin and 0.7% copper. Then there is the tin, copper, silver alloy, which is also popular. Any company that wants a global presence must use lead-free solder. As a result, any new product you buy will sport lead-free solder. There are three particular downsides to this new lead-free solder. First, its melting temperature is noticeably higher. It is harder to work with on the bench. Second, it is more brittle. Cracked solder joints are more prevalent. Now, the last I knew, the military would not allow lead-free solder in their devices for this specific reason. It is not mechanically robust enough for their potential heavy use. Third, it can grow what are called tin whiskers from the solder joint, which can short to neighboring pins. These can be quite long and intrusive. Now that we know what solder is, let's start talking about the two basic requirements for a good solder joint, cleanliness and heat. When we talk about cleanliness, there are two areas of concern. The stuff that we're soldering and the tool that we're soldering with. We first turn our attention to the stuff you're trying to solder. We have to be sure that the corrosion is gone because solder does not stick to oxides. We need bare metal of the right type. Solder will not stick to aluminum either. You can perform mechanical cleaning with such things as steel wool, a pen eraser, very, very fine grit emery cloth, or other similar things to clean the oxides off of the surface and get to the bare metal. Here's a case in point with this piece of copper clad PC board material. You can see the dark copper oxide on the surface. Before I would use this for anything, I would use some fine steel wool to clean off the corrosion until I get a nice, bright, shiny copper surface. To some extent, we also depend on chemical means to clean the metal surfaces to be soldered. This is why we have rosin core solder. 
The rosin in the core of the solder is a chemical which reacts with the copper oxide to further clean the metal surface. As you can guess, they cannot get a lot of that rosin stuff in the core of the solder. Thus, sometimes this is not sufficient, so we want to also have a tin of soldering paste such as this one and maybe a flux pen like this one. We use this to add additional chemical cleaning agents to the soldering process. CAUTION! Do not use acid core solder or acid based solder paste. These are for copper plumbing, not electronics. The corrosive nature of these will simply ruin your project. While the topic of cleanliness is in reference mainly to the stuff you're soldering, it can also refer to the cleanliness and proper maintenance of the soldering iron tip. A poorly maintained soldering iron tip will not conduct heat well to what you are trying to solder. While you're sure it's hot enough, it just won't melt the solder. Depending on the soldering iron tip, corrosion and slag can build up on the tip, effectively insulating your tip from your work. Keeping the tip clean and tinned is something that you do throughout the soldering process by wiping it periodically on a wet sponge like this one, and then adding a bit of solder back to the tip. If it's a bit more stubborn, you can also use something like this brass wool to wipe the tip. In either case, always add a little solder to the tip to retin it. They also have some soldering iron tip cleaner paste like this stuff. It contains a chemical cleaner and powdered solder to clean and retin the tip. This is more of an occasional maintenance than the everyday stuff. Before parking your soldering iron for the day, always give it a good wipe on your sponge and then put a good glob of solder on it. Then shut it off and let it completely cool before storing it away. Now we come to the next important aspect of making a good solder joint. Heat. We have on one hand the actual melting temperature of the solder. On the other hand, we have to get things heated up pretty quickly. So it will melt and adhere well. According to the soldering iron and solder manufacturers, the recommended soldering iron tip temperatures are 700 degrees Fahrenheit or 371 degrees Celsius for the 1063 lead 37 leaded solder and 750 degrees or 399 degrees Celsius for the lead free solder. So why so hot? You might wonder why are we using 700 degree Fahrenheit tip temperatures if the melting temperature of the solder itself is a mere 361 degrees Fahrenheit. This is because the rate of heat flow from one object to another is in part a function of the temperature difference of the two objects. Sure, we could probably get away with a lot lower temperature but it would take forever to get the thing we are soldering hot enough to melt the solder. Meanwhile, a lot more than just the spot we're soldering is going to get really hot, potentially ruining parts in the process. There are two basic kinds of soldering irons available. There's constant heat and there's constant temperature. There is no temperature control on constant heat soldering irons or soldering guns. It just pours out the heat at a constant rate, which is measured in watts. The tip may get to temperatures way above the recommended tip temperatures while sitting idle, and then drop when you make contact with the work to be soldered. Check out my 200 watt soldering gun. It is real obvious that the tip temperature is seriously above the recommended temperatures but it will drop quickly once what I am soldering starts sucking heat away from it. If the item you are soldering sucks away heat at a greater rate than the soldering iron can provide, the tip temperature will quickly drop below the needed level and a cold solder joint will be the result. The wattage is a measure of how much heat the soldering iron has available and how well it can maintain tip temperatures at or above the needed level to provide reliable solder joints. You have to make sure your soldering iron has enough heat to quickly heat the item to be soldered while maintaining a high enough temperature to properly flow the solder onto the joint. 
This particular style is the most common among hobbyists as they are generally relatively inexpensive. 25 watts is kind of the rule of thumb for general electronic soldering. Then there is the constant temperature soldering irons. With these, there is a temperature measurement device associated with the tip of the soldering iron. The soldering iron system will control the number of watts it directs to the heating element to maintain the set temperature. This type is often found in soldering stations and are more expensive than their constant heat cousins. With this in mind, we'd like to think that soldering possibilities are limitless with this sort. The soldering iron will just pour on the heat as I need it. Well, this is not the case. Even these have a maximum wattage output. My Weller soldering station has a limit of 50 watts with a Weller ETA tip. You can control the actual amount of heat available to the solder tip itself by the kind of tip you choose. The smaller or longer the tip, the less heat you have to work with. It is a good idea to have an assortment of tips so that you can always have the right tip for the job. If you do any amount of soldering, a temperature controlled soldering station is the preferred tool to use. I totally have to mention one other kind of soldering tool, a hot air heat gun. They direct superheated air at the thing to be soldered. These are used for certain types of surface mount devices that have no visible pins to get a soldering iron on. They are part of a reflow soldering station. You can use a heat gun that you buy from the local hardware store in this fashion. I've done it. But these have one major drawback that the official reflow heat guns don't. The airflow is way too fast. They will literally blow the parts off of the board. They might be okay for removing parts, not so good for putting them on. True reflow hot air guns have a very low air flow rate. But even with this, you still have to be very careful or you can still blow the tiny light little parts off the board. I've done that too. We will talk more of this in the video covering soldering surface mount devices. There is one more basic little known fact about soldering and solder. Did you know that solder will move toward the source of heat? Heat on one side, adding solder on the other, the solder will naturally wick itself toward the source of heat. You can really use this fact to your advantage in some situations. So there are the foundational facts about soldering. In my next video, I will be demonstrating how this works out in practice. If you found this video helpful, please click on the like and don't forget to subscribe to the channel. Thank you so much for watching. Until next time, toodaloots.